Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I'm a librarian, Jennifer Dye at the Detroit Public Library. We've had a strong program with the League of Women Voters Detroit for about two years now. We present on issues of concern to Michigan voters and other voters about 10 months of the year. You were brought into this program muted. Please put any questions into the chat. Ruth Coolwine will capture these questions and ask them at the end of the presentation. We might be able to allow people to unmute at the end to ask questions directly. This presentation will be recorded and it will be made available on DPLs and the Detroit League's websites. I'm pleased to announce that they have given us our own channel on, on the uh, Detroit Public Library's YouTube list. We had hoped to have the current president of the chapter um, explain about uh, the D Detroit League, and she was not able to make it. So Cheryl Bookoff, who is a member of the committee and a, uh, a volunteer extraordinaire for the chapter, um, you seem to, uh, to volunteer in a lot of capacities. Would you please introduce the League? Certainly. <clears throat> We're very happy to have all of you here. Um, and it is, it's been our pleasure to work with the library all the last two or three years now, it seems like. At any rate, <clears throat> the League, as you may know or not know about, uh, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan political organization with national, state, and local components. For a century, we have worked to empower voters by informing citizens about local candidates public policy and advocacy programs. We encourage active participation in the political process. The League does not endorse or support candidates or political parties. We conduct candidate forums, register voters, hold informational meetings and advocate for voters' rights. Our goal is to have elected officials represent our entire community, not just a few. We work to ensure each and every vote is county and the voting systems are fair, free, and accessible to, to all. We invite you to join us as we make democracy work in our communities. The League of Women Voters is open to new members who share our ideals. We work to engage Detroit, Hamtramck, and Highland Park citizens, two small communities within Detroit. Um, in, in we work to inv involve people in local governance, decision-making and issues of interest. Our membership is open to everyone. We seek diversity, equity, inclusion in all of our endeavors. And remember that democracy is not a spectator sport. I will put information about the league if anyone's interested in joining us or finding out more about it in the chat at some point. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. To American Pen. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you. We're very pleased to have uh, Hannah and Citra from uh, Pen America here to present. Um, they will help us to learn how to use psychological science and journalism to work against disinformation. Hannah and Citra, thank you. Well, hi, everyone. Um, it's it's really, really great to be here. Um, I have this is maybe my second or third presentation with the um, Detroit Public Library and the League of Women Voters Detroit. So thank you so, so much for for having me back. Um, as you can see, I'm also joined by my partner in crime, uh, Diani Chitra. Um, so I'll give her a chance to introduce herself. Um, do you want to go ahead? Chitra? Yeah. Um, thanks, Hannah. Hi, everyone. My name is Diane Citra. I go by Citra. Uh, and I am Pen America's Senior uh, Program Manager uh, for Journalism and Disinformation. I work hand in hand uh, with Hannah. We are practically uh, attached at the hip. Uh, and then, um, yeah, so we, we always tag team like this. And uh, I'll 
pick up on some stuff that Satana, I think, has to leave a little bit early. So I will start my presentation after Hannah. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, as Citra was just saying, we um, are going to break this presentation up into kind of halves. Um, so I am the US Free Expression Programs Coordinator, um, and I am going to be, you know, really focusing on um, how disinformation is a free expression issue, um, which will, of course, relate to the psychology of how disinformation works. Um, especially in the context of democracy and elections um, and news that re we receive about elect electoral processes. Um, and then I'll hand it over to Chicha about halfway through um, so that she can really dive into um, how journalists um, and you know uh, civil society organizations like the League of Women Voters can work together um, to defeat disinformation. Um, that's, I used to think that was such a strong word, like, oh, we're really going to defeat disinformation. But you know what, I think that like, it's a long game, and we really got to keep our eyes on the prize and, and we can do it. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna backtrack on that one today. Um, so I am going to share my screen. And I would love if folks would, um, if you have questions, or you want to stop me in the middle of the conversation, please um, feel free to uh, just unmute. Uh, unmute yourself and and um, if that's okay with the with the facilitators of this evening's um, uh, presentation, I'm I'm here for it. Um, Hannah, we yeah. uh, they can raise their hand. Okay, we have it you set up so they hand. can't unmute. Ah, I see. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, I <laughs> overstepped my bounds there. <laughs> um, but please do feel free to ask your questions in the chat as well. Um, I will try to be keeping an eye on that. Um, as I go about the presentation. Um, and then when I'm finished, I'll give a few minutes um, before I leave if you have any questions specifically for me. Um, otherwise, you'll be in amazing hands with Citra as um, the, the part two of this presentation. And I'm really, exciting, really excited that you all are able to um, hear directly from her as she's really been um, leading our uh, disinformation and journalism program for the past few months. Um, so you are all are in for a treat. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. Please bear with me. Okay, and then okay, how's that for everyone? Good. Okay. Wonderful. Um, okay, so today we are, as you know, going to be reflecting on the roles of psychology and journalism in combating election disinformation. Um, and of course, we're meeting at kind of an interesting juncture here, right? It's um, after, it's exactly one week post midterms, um, while there are still some races um, being, uh, or the votes are still being counted. Um, we are largely on the other side. Um, and so we're going to be kind of doing a little bit of a look back, but mostly um, focused on the on the psychology. So a little bit more general. Um, as as most of you probably know, PEN America is a national level organization with chapters around the United States, um, including Detroit, yay, um, as well as um, some places in the South like Arizona. And I'm actually um, reporting to you live from Arizona right now. I um, The reason I have to leave early today is because I'm meeting with um, some journalists and activists to kind of discuss, have kind of like a post-mortem on um, how the midterms went here. And so that's just to give you a little bit of an overview of the type of work that we're um, doing in relation to the elections um, in uh, the next couple of years as well. Um, this this work will be ongoing, of course, um, but we do uh, really focus in on how journalists can um, help defeat this info um, in tandem with um, other parts of, of society, including educators, um, civil society organizations, libraries, et cetera. Um, and so we're really, like, like I said, kind of taking that interdisciplinary approach to the issue, um, which is what we'll get into today. Um, so when we have these huge discussions, we, we often find it um, useful to kind of orient ourselves around um, first and foremost, why PEN America as a free expression organization um, takes up uh, the issue of disinformation. And um, I always like to kind of 
let folks know also that we, um, in our charter that was framed up in um, 1948, we um, specifically mention um, threats um, and com um, a commitment to fighting mendacious publication, which is kind of this fancier way <laughs> of saying uh, false information, fraudulent news, um, and disinformation. Um, and so as we're seeing today, as you know, they did a um, hundred years ago, um, obviously 1948 isn't quite a hundred years ago, but PEN America is a 100 year organization. So this charter was in the works. Um, we today as well see this deluge of falsehoods um, in words and images um, into public conversation and deliberate campaigns. Um, by different operatives, right? These are folks who are seeking political, financial, or societal advantage, um, but really using disinformation to impede the public's access to accurate information um, needed for civic engagement and informed decision-making. Um, we believe that it undermines public discourse and sows discord and weakens our political system and that um, and ultimately our democracy upon which these free expression rights rest. Um, so as we really kind of monitor this diminished faith in our election system, as you know, we've very recently seen, or for example, the lives lost by undermining public health response to the pandemic, or of course, an insurrection at the Capitol um, that was intended to disrupt peaceful transition of power. These are all, um, you know, unfortunate effects of disinformation and its disenfranchisement and uh, disempowerment um, and thus harming free expression and democracy. As you can kind of see like the pattern of how disinformation works, um, there are a few that really stand out. So we think about it as weaponizing divisive topics or wedge issues, you may um, call them, such as elections. And this is really meant to polarize people and weaken society's ability to engage and come together. Um, we also see it in eroding trust, of course, and exacerbating societal inequities, which of course are disproportionately targeting communities of color, LGBTQ plus communities, immigrants, and other underserved communities. Um, so this is kind of the big picture understanding of how disinformation harms um, different communities' ability to participate in, um, uh, in our democracy. Um, and so I, I'm not gonna go through all these, but just to, to give you um, an understanding of, of kind of the breadth of um, PEN America's investment in, in disinformation, um, we've really been tracking disinformation um, for the past few years. And um, there's a couple landmark reports that I just wanna point out um, in case you are a disinformation nerd and wanna, wanna uh, check them out after this presentation. Um, but I just wanted to really point out faking news and truth on the ballot as our two um, landmark reports, like I said, that explore the way that fraudulent news and online disinformation really distort public discourse um, and skew voting de decisions. Um, the one, the report that's highlighted in blue there um, is what Cheech is going to really kind of uh, dig into in the second half of the conversation. Um, she'll talk some of, about some of the learnings from one of one from this report, um, and it will it will really kind of you'll see how it um, informs the way that we approach the psychology of disinformation. Um, so I won't get into that too much right now. Okay, I'm almost finished with the preamble, but I, I really feel strongly that it's um, important for us all to be on the same page in terms of why the free expression angle. Um, why PEN America, and then of course the being on the same page with terminology um, as we launch into this discussion. Um, and so most of you probably know this at this point, but uh, I always find that it's worth differentiating between disinformation and misinformation at the top. Um, increasingly, I find that the word disinformation is not doing the work that we want it to do. Um, it's really, it's really, become very vague, but it's what we have right now. And so when we say disinformation, we're referring to 
false information that is deliberately and often covertly spread with the intent to influence public opinion or obscure the truth. So it really comes down to um, the difference of intent. So disinformation comes with that intent to harm. Misinformation, on the other hand, could just be correct, incorrect or misleading information that is spread without the intent to harm. Um, and it could just be like an accidental um, or unknowing uh, spreading of, of false information. Um, and so again, just to reiterate the differences in the intent. Um, and though it may be difficult to prove, sometimes this is like a whole other psychological um, conundrum that we can get into later, um, but it is, we can take kind of a microscopic look at, at specific examples of false information that can then uncover you know, like nefarious motives, for example, like discouraging people from voting. Um, and if you can really drill down to that intent and that motive, you know that there's a difference there. Okay, so um, I thought I would just kind of start out with a, with an example, um, bringing it home to Michigan. Um, of course, um, you know, we're we're not going to amplify um, anything. She's just going to talk a little bit about um, the process of proper debunking and all that. But um, as we talk about misinformation and kind of the fears that it preys on, or um, you know, the 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 things that people, the um, closely held beliefs that disinformation really tries to um, attack and prey on it with people. Um, you can see how like this inflammatory language um, on this post, like here we go again, that kind of thing. Um, and this is of course from the um, disinformation purveyor, gateway pundit. Um, and so the claim here, of course, and you know, you all are in Detroit, so I don't need to tell anything you don't know, but, um, or I won't tell anything that you don't know, but you know, I, I think it's a good example to show that the, that folks like the AP are paying, trying to pay attention to these kinds of things as well. But um, this is this is a good example of how like minute facts can be distorted. So the claim here was that newly discovered video from election night um, at the TCF Center in Detroit showed tens of thousands of illegal ballots being delivered eight hours after the deadline. Um, and then, of course, the AP's assessment is that this was false because the 8 p.m. deadline on election day in Michigan was for voters to cast their ballots, not for those ballots to be delivered or counted. And so I like this example because it really shows that, you know, the electoral the electoral process is complicated. It has very specific deadlines. It's um, it's it's meant to be secure in that in that complexity. Um, but it's very easily twistable by um, purveyors of disinformation and can it so doubt so easily. And so it's really important to be um, ready to, to debunk these kinds of claims with um, proper information or at the very least being able to, um, you know, show somebody how they can find the proper information. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later um, with, with this example in mind. And so this, oh, oops, sorry about that. Okay, so um, this uh, really becomes kind of a domino effect. Um, when you spread disinformation or, you know, if somebody's spreading disinformation and they think it's true, it then becomes misinformation. You really have this charged atmosphere that becomes very polarized and trust just kind of crumbles in the mix as well, right? And so if we think of this as a, as, as a domino effect type of thing, this proliferation of mis and disinformation is always going to end up jeopardizing opportunities for civil dialogue and civic engagement. Without those opportunities for civic engagement and dialogue, the, the that that really re leaves room for intolerance and misinformed opinions about different communities, about different candidates, for example, um, et cetera. So it's really important to be able to understand the like very tangible and real effects of prol the proliferation of disinformation. We also know that disinformants seek to deepen those divisions and distrust by making it harder to vote. If you are discouraged or um, confused about how to how to do it, among other forms of different types of civic engagement, 
that can often lead to this preservation of inequities, um, making it harder again for people to, to participate. Um, and so we're gonna look a little bit now at how, you know, these are kind of the effects, but now we're gonna look at kind of a, a, deeper, um, a deeper understanding of how disinformation works on the brain. And so of course, it turns out that psychology plays quite an influential role in how we consume and accept information, right? And this often comes in the form of um, a series of elements here that I'm going to, pop up onto the screen um, and this kind of uh, rudimentary graphic thing um, that's meant to showcase the perfect storm that all of these factors can kind of cause um, on our brains and, and how it kind of ha can hack the way that we consume information. And I do say we because I think it's also really important to remember that as we're studying this, as we're having these conversations, it's important to acknowledge that everybody's susceptible to it. There aren't like specific communities that are more susceptible to disinformation. There are communities that are more targeted by disinformation or haven't been served by mainstream media, et cetera. But um, these factors in particular that's on the screen right now are very human tendencies. But if we can kind of dissect them and understand them, that's the first step in being able to, um, you know, effectively apply tools against disinformation. So these are all kind of technical terms, apart from emotions, of course, um, for the different ways that disinformation can can hack our brain. Um, but I think that that they're actually pretty understandable concepts here. So with the kernel of truth, this is really just referring to how the, the, the way that disinformation is often presented with a kernel of truth. Um, so in other words, like it may come with just a little bit of um, facts that are then kind of the, the gateway for that disinformation to kind of take hold in our minds. So think about like a post or a tweet that like kind of looks real, or maybe it's a whole disinformation narrative that contains one fact that's actually true. Um, that again is kind of like, sometimes I think of this as kind of like a parasite situation where it, or, or you know, it, it kind of travels in, the disinformation travels in with, with some truth. Um, so it's important to kind of remember that it can, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It can be some disinformation, some facts. And so I think really understanding and embracing the, the um, nuanced nature of this issue is really important. So um, this can also be like false connections and misleading content um, or you know, maybe a miscaptioned um, photo. So I really think of this as the, this is the nuanced part that we really need to um, make sure that we, that we better understand um, so that we aren't oversimplifying the, the situation. With the illusory truth effect, this is really just, this is actually one of my favorite ways of saying this, but it's really just the theory that the more we encounter something, the more we believe it. So repetition is this really, really powerful tool, right? That creates a gut level feeling that something is true. Um, and so, you know, for example, if we hear the lie that there was widespread election fraud over and over and over, if you're somebody that maybe doesn't pay attention to the news or doesn't um, know how to seek out credible sources or you aren't being served by credible sources, maybe you're in a news desert, et cetera, but you're just hear hearing over and over and over, like that's a psychological phenomenon that's acting on you um, thanks to disinformation. Um, and so again, as we're um, better understanding these psychological phenomena, it's really good to think about how to undo that. Um, but I think it's also very humanizing um, when we think about how disinformation can act on, um, you know, friends or family, but we'll talk about that later. Um, emotions, pretty self-explanatory, but, you know, with disinformation, we often see um, signals of urgency, like exclamation points or all caps. I'm thinking of disinformation online, um, for example, but it really is kind of this fear mongering 
um, element where disinformation is preying on on um, things that we're already scared of, or um, you know, think about like financial insecurity or something like that. If if um, disinformants know that that's something that a specific community or a specific person is already scared of, they may take advantage of that and target disinformation in that way. Um, it can also, of course, target anger that can cloud judgment, um, that kind of thing. Confirmation bias is, of course, referring to our hu very human tendency to seek out sources of information from sources that support our own beliefs. So we really see this play out in the way, of, like how polarized our society becomes to in the polarization of our news sources and who we naturally turn to. Um, you know, disinformation really can become a very profitable uh, industry, right? If if you know what folks' um, existing attitudes are and you can really just push that, you're gonna get those clicks, you're gonna get that engagement. So sometimes I think about um, kind of the business of disinformation when I think about confirmation bias and um, the polarization of our, of our news sources. And then dual process theory is really just a fancy way of saying that humans are like naturally inclined to take the easier way of understanding something. So um, it's it's defined as this idea that the brain usually goes with one of two basic ways of thinking. And, you know, forgive me for getting too technical, but we, we promised we were going to talk about the psychology today. So, so here we go. Um, process one, uh, our system one is, is that automatic rote processing that requires very little effort. So kind of think about, um, you know, you're scrolling through Twitter or your Facebook feed or something, and you're just kind of, you're taking in the information, but maybe you're not like really thinking about it. System two is that thinking about it process. So that's the analytical process that requires more effort, that critical thinking and being on guard for threats of false content. So because we're, you know, more comfortable with the easy or, um, you know, kind of just consuming information without um, always applying those critical thinking skills, we'll usually use system one um when we think we can get away with it um but oftentimes you know going back to the nuanced nature of all this we really need to be employing system two more often um and you can read more about this online but i i you know in terms of how psychologists um talk about this um this that these are some of the phenomena that they that they refer to um among others that uh chicha is going to talk about later Okay, and then I would be remiss to um, have a full conversation about uh, how to deal with disinformation and misinformation if I didn't address our our advice on how to talk to somebody who who shares it. Um, and so this is advice that was written um, over the over the past couple of years be, in response to the most common question that we got in our webinars in our um, panel discussions, et cetera, it was, well, okay, I know how to scope, like seek out um, credible information, but how do I talk to my friends, my family, my students, my, you know, whoever that share misinformation um, without, you know, shutting the conversation down or getting too tense. And so here's just a couple of things um, that we, you know, this isn't a one size fits all situation, but we do um, offer some of these tips. Um, so first, of course, try to verify that the content is misleading before you engage or false. Um, the worst thing you're, you're going to do is, is um, kind of uh, harm that trust if it turns out that what you think is misinformation is actually true and then you flip it on its head, right? This is kind of that humbling moment of being like, okay, let me make sure, let me fact check first and you can employ your own media literacy skills in that moment. Two is really one um, to go back to our psychological phenomena, right? So consider the perspective of the person who shared this, who shared the story or misinformation or whatever. There's probably a reason in there that they shared that information, right? Or shared that disinformation. This is going to um, require a lot of empathy sometimes. Um, but if we're if we're committed to having these conversations with people, we really have to at least consider the perspective of that person. And I think 
I would argue that this step would also help you get to um, kind of a strategic point where you know how that how you might be able to change their mind or might be able to um, get them to credible information if you consider their perspective. And then of course, if things are going you know, kind of south and um, you, you're, it's escalating really quickly, have an exit plan. Um, know how to like protect your own mental health too. Sometimes these conversations can be really tense and you don't wanna, you know, disinformation has destroyed enough relationships with people. <laughs> um, so if you are going to engage in these conversations, um, just make sure you know when to, to call it quits. And then of course, be a resource um, for others and know um, some credible, culturally attuned news sources that you can direct folks to. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the tr about trusted messengers and um, culturally attuned information in, in, the, in the next slide or so. But I also just wanted to say, you know, in the hard news report that she's just gonna talk a little bit more about, we based it on a survey of journalists um, who really kind of despaired about ever reaching this like segment of people who appear just kind of like, detached and unmoored from this shared fact base and just not really open to reading fact checks. And so this is kind of our, you know, I wouldn't say like overarching response, but this is kind of one of our responses to, if you feel like you aren't ever going to be able to reach that person, you know, make sure you can take a step back and, and protect, your, protect your own um, space there. You can offer, credible information. You can consider their perspective over and over, but this is something that we can't really ignore, um, especially from the research that we have, that there, that like there's there's kind of this despair at not being able to reach people. And so I think it's important to just recognize that we're all learning together um, and it can be really hard to approach these conversations. Um, and again, there's no one size fits all. All that being said, I think that we we really love to talk about trusted messengers in this conversation because this these are these are the folks that um, you know as as you as you can see at this point the psychology is really important and so if you have trust in somebody already that can be that person can really be this this really important stopgap to this ever going flow of disinformation um, and so trusted messengers can look like many different people right. Um, we at PEN America are, are trying to work really closely with community leaders, fact checkers, journalists, um, and other activists on the ground um, in our uh, PEN, across, or our Pen um, America chapter cities so that we can equip and prepare these community leaders with the uh, tools that they, that they need um, to be able to address the situation um, effectively, responsibly, and in taking care of themselves. But Trust is first and foremost one of the most important um, things, right? Who's going to like you all are here because you you are interested in in um, trying to stop the flow of mis and disinformation. But um, maybe 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 we Pen America is a trusted messenger for you, but we might not be that trusted messenger for other people. So it's really important to have that like humility if you're going to um, go into this and say, you know what, I might not be the trusted messenger for everybody, but I can try and seek out um, credible trusted sources for, for, um, for my community. Um, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, okay, so this leads to kind of our focus on journalism and community media as um, a trusted messenger and therefore a stopgap to disinformation. Um, all of these things are just inextricably connected, right? And so I think it's important to remember that like, when we talk about disinformation, the problem of disinformation, when we talk about um, a lack of civic engagement, et cetera, et cetera, we are kind of talking about all of these components together. And I think it's a, it would do us a disservice to think about them in siloed um, components. So when we talk about disinformation defense, we find that it's really important um, and crucial to, um, to offer a, a proactive uh, response. That's not just, okay, here's how you stop 
and here's how you spot and stop disinformation. That's just one half of it. The other half of it is knowing who those credible, uh, who that credible trusted messenger is, who that credible local news source is, um, and knowing why. So um, we also find it really important to be uplifting local journalism for obvious reasons. There are news deserts, local journalism is taking a huge financial hit, um, but local journalism is also more trusted than national counter their national counterparts. So again, I'm gonna bring up trust here. If distrust is such a huge role, plays such a huge role in the spread of mis and disinformation, then you're going to want to uplift those that are already trusted. Um, and I think that there are, um, there's kind of this renaissance of really amazing uh, nonprofit local journalism, community media, in language journalism that's happening, that's popping up as a response to the issue of disinformation. And we really applaud that and, and want to talk about it. Um, and so, you know, there are, there are a couple different definitions for, for community media. Um, it is like, you know, a type of local journalism, a type of hyper localized um, journalism. And I want to like really also shout out the Center for Community Media at the um, New Mark J School in, um, in New York. It is um, really kind of at the forefront of being able to define and effectively um, use community journalism and teach um, perspective or teach students and upcoming journalists how to really engage um, in community media. And um, I, 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 it's important to highlight it in this um, presentation, I, I feel, because as we talk about specifically election disinformation, we know that it, it targets communities that are often underserved by mainstream media, right? So if you have a problem that's targeting these specific communities, you have to have that proactive approach and that proactive response um, in the form of community media um, that offers credible information in, this, in the void of, um, of credible information, right? And so um, when we talk about community media, this is a definition that's that um, is is taken from the Center for Community Media, um, but it's local journalism for and by Black, Latinx, Asian, Indigenous, LGBTQ, and other underserved U.S. communities. So think of it as exactly what it sounds: community specific media. It's culturally attuned media. It knows how to speak to the communities that it is of and serves. Um, so these these organizations are going to provide culturally attuned messaging that um, really speaks to the to the folks that they're serving. And this is so essential when disinformation is swooping in and um, again, trying to preserve those existing inequities. So we really have to be throwing our weight behind um, community media. Um, and so for the purposes of this uh, conversation, I, I wanted to throw out a couple of, this isn't, um, these two that I have um, in uh, or on the screen are not um, specific to um, any like ethnic communities in Michigan, um, but I wanted to shout out Outlier Media because they do priority, prioritize black and brown communities in Detroit. Um, and then in the context of election disinformation, um, Vote Beat uh, has a couple of reporters in Michigan um, that report on the electoral processes there. Um, but I know that there are some really incredible, um, I think Planet Detroit, I think is working with Outlier Media um, and a couple of other smaller organizations that are serving specific communities um, that I would really encourage you to check out um, in your city, if you don't already know about them, of course. <laughs> um, and then this is just um, a little bit more about why we really believe in the power of community media as a response to disinformation. Um, so we, you know, you can find this on our website. Um, I won't read through it for the in the interest of time, um, but it, we really do feel that um, the way that community media can inform, empower, protect, and connect people um, is is really these these are kind of the four pillars that really um, showcase that really show that community media can. Um, do what mainstream media cannot. Um, and this is, uh, we, we created this kind of, these, these tenants uh, or kind of how we see community media in response to our World Press Freedom Day um, 
and how community media, especially that type of media serving diaspora communities around the states, um, can really be, again, a, a, a way to protect against um, surveillance, a way to protect against disinformation, a way to empower people. Um, and then in this last slide, I'll just say, um, this is just kind of another connecting the dots moment that I think um, I really like to, to it's, it's kind of bleak, but I think it's important to know that when we're talking about disinformation and we're talking about um, the way that it can prey on us, um, it's important to know that the, the end goal of purveyors of disinformation is to erode public trust in institutions like electoral processes, um, for example. And so I also kind of find that, you know, if you, if you offer a reason that disinformation is being spread, it can be kind of like, okay, now I understand like why sp certain communities are being targeted, or now I understand why, um, it's, it's actually a profitable business for people who are spreading disinformation. I think it can be really empowering for people to understand the why behind these things. And um, going back to the nuance point, if we are offering our communities and the public the information that they need to understand why this phenomenon is happening, why disinformation is a threat, it's more likely that they are going to feel invested um, and want to protect themselves against it. Um, you know, also as reporting fins, um, it's important to be supporting community media in language journalism, especially, um, and protecting the public um, that hasn't been served or is less equipped to understand um, proce these processes because they haven't been served with credible information in their language or something like that. Um, also important in, in terms of the, the kind of bleak domino <laughs> effect that we have here, disinformation often leads to harassment and distrust. So um, it, that can be harassment against local journalists, but it can also be election officials, right? If there's um, the lie that election fraud is happening on a broad scale, this kind of disinformation can um, directly impact the, the safety of not only local journalists, but election officials, right? So. The public's access to accurate information can affect all of these different ways um, of civic engagement. And I think, again, I if there if I leave you with anything, I really want it to be that context is extremely important, um, so that folks can really understand the nuance of this issue, um, but also leaning into the the real power of community media um, as part of the solution. Um, and so with that, I will open it up to questions for a couple minutes before I have to run out to um, this, this um, next event, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so there's one in the um, chat here about how many news organizations are 501c3s across the country. Um, and for example, a local news organization in Michigan here is Bridge, and that is a 501c3 mm -hmm. organization. Do you have any idea of the number that are like that? Honestly, I don't have a number, but I have a website um, that I can that I would love to to share with with you all in the chat if I can pull it up. Um, it's it's a good um, it's a it's it's really just the Institute for Nonprofit News. I'll, I'll pull it up in a second, but um, it's a good kind of national overview of the different nonprofit news organizations that are popping up over the country and how they you know, work together and learn from each other. Um, I've heard of Bridge before. Um, they're great. Um, I mentioned Outlier um, Media. I think there's um, also URL Media, um, which is um, specifically supporting, you know, nonprofit news organizations that serve um, black and brown communities. Um, exact numbers, I don't know though. <laughs> um, I know that the Center for Community Media um, and Chitra have, have both been um, kind, of, kind of trying to map out the ethnic news media ecosystems across the United States. And those aren't always nonprofit. Um, but, you know, and I'm also, I'm also not hundred percent sure with the question, if it's like nonprofit versus, um, partisan leaning, cause that's kind of a different conversation. <laughs> um, but yeah. yeah, maybe you can speak to a little bit more, um, is, is, is the fact that it, a news organization is a 501c3 make it more trustworthy or, um, 
Is that something that should be part of our decision making about it? I would say you should at least at the very, very least know if you're reading something that's partisan leaning, right? If they're not, if a news organization is, um, you know, partisan leaning and they're not upfront about it, something's wrong. Um, the, some of the, you know, hallmarks of credible journalism is transparency and, you know, there, there's a lot of conversation about the, um, importance of objectivity, I would say that 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 conversation is a little bit sticky. And I'll, I'll take my Pan America hat off for a second and just say that I like, as an individual, I think that um, the concept of objectivity needs to be like rethought in journalism. Um, and I think it's really important to 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 go in with a critical mind when you're thinking about those things. Um, but if, if it's like, um, I think the last presentation I did with the Detroit Public Library was about, um, was about pink slime journalism. And th that is um, kind of the, the, the effect of, of partisanship, of partisan funders um, masquerading as uh, like a, a small local news um, resource or small local news outlet that's actually partisan and they, they kind of hide their their funding and their their intentions and that is I think that's wrong <laughs> um and so that's what I would just say there sure and we're um the question asker is pointing out that um by force 501c3 should be nonpartisan. yes according to the rules um another question do you have a list of good community media sources in detroit hamtramck highland park and michigan in general if not how do we find out about them <laughs> um well i would definitely say here i'll try it i'll type in the chat outlier media is incredible um i think somebody mentioned bridge detroit um the the other one was i don't know if planet detroit is still around um, but they, they're amazing too. And of course, these are kind of the smaller um, outlets that I um, think that folks might not uh, already know about. But of course, you know, you guys are you guys are the experts in terms of Detroit. So I would I would just definitely leave it. Chicha, was there were there any um, ethnic news media that you wanted to point out in Detroit? I, I don't want to put you on the spot. But if there was, I wanted to give you a chance. Uh, no. So uh that's something what we are planning to build but so far because uh i'm a recent hire at ken and we're trying to build this database of reliable community media so far i've only gone through florida texas and arizona but uh, i am focusing on some other states and i think my next in line are is actually michigan so we are hoping that we could put that data out uh you know, once we have a list of, we will categorize it as, as resources of community, nonpartisan, hyperlocal media. So to answer your question, it's not yet, but we're hoping that's the kind of resources that uh, Penn could put out, hopefully in collaboration with organizations such as League of Women Borders and Detroit Public Library. Those are all the questions I have in the chat. Um, I don't know if there's another that someone would like to raise their hand in the reactions at the bottom bar. Yes, Cheryl. You have to unmute. Yes, and a lot not saying anything when I asked them. Anyway, um, I, I'm just wondering, because you said at the bottom of one slide um, that Pan America is freedom to write. Does that, do you really just cover journalists or do you also cover the verbal kind of media sources? I mean, I assume we're we're talking about all of that when we're talking about this in terms of how misinformation, disinformation gets uh, shared. But um, is there any difference between those two in terms of laws or rights or, or do's or don'ts? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we um, when we talk about journalism, um, it, 
sorry, I guess I should kind of clarify. We have we have kind of two arms of pen. So one is um, supporting literary um, writers, poets, essayists, novelists, et cetera. And then the other is um, the kind of our freedom of expression programs. And that encompasses um, all like different types of artists, um, different types of journalists, including um, radio broadcast. I assume that's kind of what you were referring to. Um, and so, yes, we, we um, definitely, I would say, probably focus on print journalism, but we definitely um, also, also work with radio journalists and, you know, we will call out, like, for example, um, like Spanish language radio um, are huge purveyors of disinformation. Um, specific, specific uh, channels, right? I'm not saying in monolithically Spanish language radio, but just, I'm just saying like, that's like one type of, um, that might be like one place that we would talk about or that we would address. Um, we, you know, of course, like if a broadcaster like Tucker Carlson is spewing disinformation, um, that's another thing that we would want to be um pointing out um but in terms of like freedom to protecting the freedom to write um is that another part of your question or is that um uh, freedom to write is also kind of just like our 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 um tagline okay i mean there isn't i guess i was wondering is there a difference in terms of how uh, the advice you would say for each of those i mean areas kind of the speech versus the uh, journal or the writing i guess i can kind of try to answer that um so the reason why we oh, we uh, deal with some with some form of journalism and some not is because the shareability right uh and this relates distinctly with social media if it's a uh, one of the most, the biggest source of disinformation is actually pictures. So regardless on image, because people scroll very easily, right? On Instagram or on Facebook. So how we deal with those media uh, on how we handle this information um, is we, it doesn't matter uh, what kind of, if it's being shared, it could be an audio clip, it could be a photo, it could be a video, which happens a lot, an altered video, an altered audio. That becomes one of the things that we want to tackle. So it's not sometimes print media put out, um, uh, you know, audio clips, sometimes uh, text, you know, on Instagram. But we we try to uh, address. Uh, all sorts, regardless if it is, you know, CNN or 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 uh, Fox. Who it's it's not the type of the medium. It is whether it reached a certain worrying point that we want to address. There are different ways that we can address that. You know, such as for image, we want to put a watermark. Uh, uh, you know, so there are various ways of. If the disinformation is in the format of audio, video, or images, we have to run it through uh, fact checking or video verification. If you are a journalist, because that's a lot of work. Uh, but that's kind of how, uh, and that's the the training or the resources that we actually want to provide to 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 the general public, journalists and community. And Hannah has to go. Yes, I just wanted to say goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much for having me. Um, and take it away, Chitra. Bye, all. Bye-bye. Um, yeah, so actually, related to your question, Cheryl, that's the kind of things that we do want to be able to provide. Um, moving forward, we want to be able to provide people uh, how to identify uh, this information. And if you are, say Detroit Public Library wants to uh, post some messages or, or, or post on Instagram or Twitter, we want to make sure we know how to watermark it so that it cannot be altered um, uh, if, you know, to make it seem like uh, it's not what you guys distributed. 
So there are ways to do that, but that is very technologically specific. Um, um, so should I, should I just <laughs> go on to, uh, to my uh, presentation? Perhaps you should go on with okay. what you planned. I mean, this is an interesting topic too, but I know you're yes. prepared with the talk. Yes, I will. Uh, so I will share my screen. Please do. So let's start uh, with. Um, So, um, is this okay? He just wanted to. Can you see? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, perfect. So, I just um, want to introduce myself first. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Diana Chitra. I am Hannah Wall's colleague at Pen America. Um, I, so Hannah and I work on the anti-disinformation program. There are two arms of this anti-disinformation program. Hannah deals mainly with community engagement sites. I mainly deal with journalists and newsroom and how to build their capacity to be more resilient against disinformation. But um, as most things are about uh, disinformation or democracy in general, um, it is really difficult to draw a distinct line between those two. Uh, so the work of journalism and newsroom are inseparable from the work of uh, engaging the community, which brought all of us here today. Um, the way that we address disinformation historically has been through fact-checking, verification. It tends to work effectively on most topics, but not ideology, identity, politics, and moral. So this is where the concept of confirmation bias that Hannah mentioned uh, comes into play. Um, we want to understand what are the norms of a certain group in a certain community, certain ecosystem that are making it very acceptable uh, acceptable for them to spread disinformation. And it's helpful to look at this comparatively. So um, let's say in comparison to patterns in other countries, uh, we are not really seeing the same patterns that we are seeing in the US in the spread of uh, disinformation. For example, I am also Indonesian. In Indonesia, um, there isn't that much polarization around specific topics such as vaccines, global conspiracy or climate change, global conspiracy or QAnon. There is, of course, disinformation everywhere, including in Indonesia, but these issues are not the polarizing issues that determine people's uh, ideologies and political affiliation. They just believe that, but they also believe other things. Um, so in the US, it does determine people's ideologies and political affiliation, and it is evidently most prevalent in very certain communities. So we need to ask, what is it about that community that is amplifying this condition? Um, so Hannah has mentioned a few of the psychological factors that matters, and I'm just going to go through them a little bit. So there are there is personality and levels of anxiety. Some people are just wired more anxious than others. I know I am one of those. Uh, that kind of chemical trait combined with socioeconomic status, historical background, racial background, immigration status, or maybe just a bad day. And, 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 and combine that with media that are injecting, say, stories of conspiracy. Media like Breitbart um, kind of just raises even the most general people level of anxiety. Uh, the second factor is um, language and lessons from leadership. Now, this is important. Um, for example, 
one politician is known to share a lot of misinformation. Um, let's say he's of the top president or leader of Congress or something. Uh, that misinformation is then amplified by other politicians and elites around him. This whole, we call it echo chamber, determines the process of how our community determines what is true and what is not. So if you, if I am a loyal party member, you will try, uh, try to amplify those messages, right? That is being spread by your leaders and your elites. Um, so this process determines the norms of our peers. Um, and that's very key in understanding all of this. What is the norm of our peers and how to understand it? So a, a person is more likely to amplify this information uh, if that person thinks, one, it's okay to get it wrong. There's no stakes in it. Two, if you think it signals that you are a good and loyal party member of your peer or member of your community. Um, to that, I'm going to use the example of access to reproductive justice, a cost that the League of Women Voters are, are working on in Michigan. So let's say I am your member and I live there and I put a sign that says no reproductive justice in my yard. If I do that, it is because I think that it is going to be well received. If I think my neighbors might not like it, I'll be less likely to do so. Um, and in relation to that, if I suddenly start sharing disinformation about reproductive justice, uh, to think, uh, uh, to, uh, or wonky statistics about reproductive justice in my social media, I probably would stop getting invited to things like this talk or conferences. And people probably would not want to work with Pan America by association. So the snowball effect could be significant. So this is the process of setting the norms of our peers. That is a very important process. And then the last one that there is the general US media ecosystem. Some ecosystems are constantly hammering on mongering themes, uh, fear mongering themes. Some are true, some are not, some are truth sandwiches. Uh, but with this kind of ecosystem, Hannah mentioned this before, even if you are a rational person, the constant barrage might make you doubt what you think is true. Uh, which leads us to the next slide. So there are all of these circumstances going on in the US now. And that newsrooms and civil society organizations such as uh, League of Women Voters and Detroit Public Library must take into consideration when we are working against disinformation. Uh, why? Because we, uh, League of Women Voters, Detroit Public Library, local newsrooms are what we call the trusted messenger in battling disinformation. Um, these trusted messengers need to be local and they need to be a member of the community that we are trying to address. Our organization, Penn, we can help with training, build capacity, forward some technological skills, but what we can only do is empower. The message, the speaking, needs to come from community members. Um, so what Penn is trying to do is that we want to empower these trusted messengers to do pre-bunking and debunking. Um, and so let's start with pre-bunking. Um, so pre-bunking, very simply, is the idea of inoculating people against false or misleading information. If you show people examples of disinformation and the rationale behind it, hopefully, knock on wood, they will be better equipped to spot it and question it kind of like how vaccine is working. So the work of pre-bunking is inseparable from debunking skills. Pre-bunkers must have debunking skills. To show you what that means, I will use the Prop 3 example. 
uh, for pre-bunking. And I am using the wonderful work at Outlier Media uh, that has done on pre-bunking around Prop 3 in Michigan. So in here, they started out with just a casual reasoning why they need to address this. Oh, it's simple. One of my community members asked, what is the status of the proposed amendment? Um, and pre-bunking does not have to be complicated. It could be as simple as a tweet or a tweet thread or IG story um, that, that, you know, it, it could be as simple as that. Um, and then they go on to explain uh, what is top three. Um, and what has happened and why it matters. So they explain that the U.S. Supreme Court decision overruled um, Roe v. Jackson, and then these are the reasonings behind the uh, the Supreme Court decision. Uh, and then we go to uh, the next, and then they go on to explain what the proposal would do. They do not mention political party, candidates, campaign, morality, ideology, none of that. Just what the proposal would do if it goes through. Now, this is important for our task as trusted messengers in our work and pre-bunking, because as Hannah mentioned, um, this job is very sensitive to ideology and identity. Uh, we must take into consideration partisanship and identity in our work in fact-checking and debunking and pre-bunking. Fact-checking is rarely effective if it doesn't come from a trusted messenger. When we are fact-checking, we have to refer to people from a variety of groups and parties. We can't always be preaching to the choir. We can preach a little bit to the ones in the middle. Uh, it does, it, you know, and that's kind of listed all the possible things that you can do to protect yourself, your space. But we, I mean, we have to branch out a little bit. There are also some people who are on the other right that bridging communication at this level would be very difficult. But that uh, we need to include from other communities. Um, so sorry, I think my headset just died. I just wanted to make sure that you guys can still hear me. OK, great. Um, and then the next one is they go on to explain um, what will happen if the proposal uh, fails. Um, just, again, no mentioning of what is just the, the legal statutes and what it would become and if it goes through and what is not. Some people might be for the uh, props, some people might not. Um, for that, it is important to let people know what are the stakes so they can make an informed decision. What are the interests that are being entangled? Uh, who pays for what, who's, you know, how many, how much money has been going through for uh, the, 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 to make this prop three goes into the news or something. We want the people, the audience, to be an active debunker. Um, so, and let's go to the next one. This is where, so this is what psychologist Dolores Albarachin from UPenn um, um, Annenberg Center, uh, she's also a member of APA, and she called it is important to identify a mental map. Try to put yourself in the way of how a disinformer would think. Um, we address the concern that may arise on this mental map. Because we've heard it before, right? When there's like, oh, voter fraud. We've learned from what we had from 2020. We know the narrative of how that kind of go. So we know what questions they might ask, how they think. Then we go to address the correction of the myth and other possible route of the myth. 
And we do this maybe a week leading up to an event that we predict might bring a slew of disinformation. So let's say before the prop three goes for on a vote, we try to post a series of things that would elaborate what is prop three. Um, and we think about um, what it means for women, what it means for children, what it means for family, what it means for single mother, uh, what it means, um, you know, for potential communities that might be affected. Um, they say uh, pre prevention is preferable to cure. So uh, with mis disinformation, it is better to prevent disinformation from spreading at all than trying to debunk once it's spread. Why? Because the debunking that we do, even if we put it on big media, it does not reach as many people as the original disinformation and they don't spread nearly as quickly. If they do reach us, they generally struggle to erase the original disinformation from our debates on our brain. It's just how our weird brain works. So even when we've been told that this information is false, research suggests that it will continue to influence the way that we think and how we argue and debate and have conversation with people about that issue. The key to do this, that's why pre-bunking really matters. Journalists and civil society organizations should aim to make their audience active debunkers. Um, so we need to teach how do you get uh, the audience to be critical. How, how, so if you say for an election, these are the questions that you need to be asking. Um, you know, where is my, uh, who is funding who? Uh, what are the policies that these candidates are? You know, is it true that they are, you know, do some Googling that they are promoting uh, anti reproductive justice? You know, these are the potential questions that we can uh, predict and kind of corral our audience to tell them what questions to ask, sort of like that. So that when they are barrage uh, with the actual disinformation, at least they would have a little sense of like, oh, let me ask this question. So um, I'll go back to this, uh, to this slide. Uh, so um, we have to take into consideration partisanship and identity and fact checking. So creating new incentives, this is actually uh, kind of cool. Uh, there is a research done at NYU uh, by, uh, um, so they do a control experiment and they put money on the table and they said, you will get money if you try to be as accurate as you can about a certain information. Um, when money is involved, regardless of partisanship and ideological or identity, they do tend to be, to, they try to be as accurate as possible for them. So I'm not saying that we should try, Facebook should try paying people money, although that would be good. But there, I think some people just spread disinformation because there are no other intriguing incentive for them. Like I said, they wanted, there's no cost because they don't mind if it's wrong because other people more important than them have thought have been wrong and it's fine, right? And then second is that it actually signals that you are a loyal party member or community member. Even if you, if you, did, if you spread disinformation that is wrong. So those are all the wrong incentives. So what this research put out is that there needs to be new incentives that are being introduced uh, to make people uh, not spread disinformation and be more invested in being accurate. The last thing is not really our 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 within our power. It, it, it is left to the gods of Facebook, Google, and Twitter. But there needs to change in um, platform practices. 
Imagine if Twitter has a button, not just like like or uh, uh, like or dislike, but there is a button for this is inaccurate and or, this is, yeah, this is misleading by community, not by Twitter itself, by, you know, by my mom, by my aunt, by my, you know, my community, by my boss. I think there would be um, less incentive for people to spread disinformation because again, norms of, of our peers and proximity matters. People around you matters more um, in the general scheme of things, whether you are being considered as a good member of society or not. So changes in platform that encourages accuracy is very, you know, we want to encourage that. And Penn is working on some policy work that could push more to create new incentives and have these changes. Um, so let's go on to the next one. So we want to make our audience an active debunker, uh, show critical thinking, what to question, how to question. But what happens when the disinformation is already here? It is happening. The question is when to debunk. Uh, you can't debunk everything because debunking everything will inadvertently amplify that disinformation um, because like we said, if, if we don't retain debunk as good as we retain the disinformation, we just remember that it's been mentioned and then it stays in our brain. Um, so research shows that only lies that are believed by more than 10% of the population merits debunking. Now, this 10%, of course, is different for different communities. And that's why we want to empower the trusted messenger so that they gauge the 10% and the level of threat of a certain disinformation. But we do not want to try to debunk everything. Um, and um, yeah. Um, yes. And this is the... So what Penn is doing, and then I will leave uh, um, 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 to, uh, to uh, questions and answers. So uh, Penn uh, are hoping that we can work more on this with Detroit Public Library and legal uh, women's voters and many other CSOs in Detroit. I think one of the key things that we have discovered since 2016 is that disinformation needs to be talked about and tackled in the context of a certain community. And the only way to do that is by empowering trusted messengers so that the community have more platform and they can speak more to the members of that community. Uh, local newsrooms are one of those trusted messenger. So, and uh, civil society organization. What we are trying to do is um, to give these kind of trainings. So we give digital safety trainings, um, you know, I, since doing this work, I have definitely become much more caref careful in my social media on how I secure my privacy, et cetera. Those are really basic things that we can do to protect our ourselves when we are working in this type of field. There is also a new feature from Google that you can uh, ask to um, take out informa personal information uh, of you uh, if you have been docs, very certain information that matters to your identity. So like social security, et cetera, you know, those you can actually, there is a form and there's a procedure and we are hoping that we can teach people that they could do that to protect themselves if they have been docs. So those are the kind of trainings. And then we wanted to provide how to pre-bunk. We will go to you know, specific topics, maybe upcoming to for the next election, we can work together again and what are the issues that we want to pre-bunk and how we can craft it, what are the approaches. We would love to do that with people, you know, in Michigan and Detroit, and you know, just give the technical skills capacity. Uh, the other thing is building fact-checking capacity. So in communities, these are very contextual, right? 
uh, there should be fact checking of so many different language and different states. That's what we believe to, to be the right thing to do. And it needs to be developed by members of those communities. The problem would be technology, right? So we can, if there's an organization in Michigan or Detroit who wants to build that, we can provide that kind of training to build fact checking capacity. Uh, you know, in issues that are that matters to their areas. Um, we also wanted to be able to um, let me go on to the so we wanted to be able to uh, give trainings for how you can uh, track disinformation, what what disinformation has been going on, who is spreading it. There are so many digital tools for this, uh, even from Google. Um, and and uh, SMAT, Junkipedia, those kind of stuff. Eventually, my program, uh, we will put out a one-stop journalism online resource in which I am hoping to be able to provide this for journalists and CSOs. We want to be able to list uh, journalists or uh, scientific resources that I will categorize in specific language because we have made the commitment to provide more in, in language resources. So we will uh, work with a uh, Spanish translator, uh, Tagalog translator, Vietnamese translator, and providing the information based on their, their language and their expertise and where are they're based. And then second, we want to issue kind of like a primer, a one pager um, for very specific communities. And we wanna create that together with the member of the communities. Say for example, I am working with a professor at UMass Amherst who is Filipino American. And we are planning to write a one pager about hate crimes against Asian Americans and how sometimes the issues of hate crimes against Asian Americans has been used as a wedge to kind of divide uh, between Asian Americans and Black Americans. So we want to kind of like give primers, be very specific on like, what are the histories, let's say of Vietnamese American in Michigan uh, what are the, their statistics, how to pronounce their name, uh, what, you know, those kind of, so that journalists and CSOs can pick up and start off with information that are true and given from the community. Um, and then these are, these are, because my background is from journalism and focusing mainly on digital. So the tools and other resources is one of the parts that I'm most excited. Uh, I would love to be able to collaborate with local organizations in Michigan and Detroit of just kind of like short, these kind of session on how to use video and image verification, uh, though the tools that I have collated and, and build the curricula are all online for free. So everyone can access it. Um, um, how to detect bots, you know, so let's say League of Women Voters has been, um, um, you know, tracking a certain disinformation issues on Twitter, and we can actually, you know, learn how to detect if the ones that has been forwarding it to you is a bot or not, you know, very simple, basic things like that. And then building your own fact checking capacity, mainly we will be using Google for this, they have pinpoint and, and, and uh, fact check explorer uh, that you can start building your own database for fact checking for issues that matters for the League of Women Voters and Detroit Public Library and the community. And then disinformation tracking tools also. So some apps, but the most basic one would be just Google Pinpoint. Um, again, available for everyone and, and just some basic, you know, uses just to help you feel more empowered and, and, and you know, armed. So that is the last slide. And sorry if I have been speaking very fast and I am open to questions and concerns and comments. 
Thanks, Sitra. We have one comment and question that's come in about if PEN America is ever interested um, in becoming someone who grades or makes a list of um, resources, which oh, are- Sorry, sorry, I can't hear you. Let me, oh, oh. oh get, I, I can hear you now, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, we have a, and I can maybe remove your spotlight too, if you'd like, but the, um, we have a question about the uh, PEN America's interest in grading trustworthiness of news organizations, similar to the Pinocchio scoring from Washington Post. Um, uh, is that something that PEN America would be interested in doing? Um, if not, why? If so, um, is that coming down the line anytime soon? Um, yeah, so uh, yes, but not in the capacity that uh, Washington Post is doing it. But we do want, like I said, we want to help people determine the norms of peers, right? And um, Washington Post determines their own peers, like their readers. But Pen of America, as, as a nonprofit, we can't say, we, we, it's not, a, a, we, we don't get to determine. Our, our peers are all of America. Who gets to decide that? Is, is the communities. And that's why I am speaking here now of, with the uh, uh, language of uh, women, uh, League of Women Votes, Voters and Detroit Public Library is that we can help you. And then once we build that together with Detroit, we will put it in our website. Um, but it can't be something that pens, these are trustworthy and these are not, they will, you know, I will get fired. But uh, not that I even know, that not that that idea have never crossed my mind. But um, we we are committed to be nonpartisan, and 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 our commitment is to empower. But yes, we can definitely uh, um, help distribute the work of our partners in our website to make sure that it is becoming the resource. So whenever anyone is looking for information about certain Michigan issues or Detroit issues, we can direct them to those, uh, um, you know, resources that we have built together with uh, the C local CSOs. I hope that uh, answers the question. Uh, I hope so too. I think it does for me, but um, Scott, if you have a follow-up question, please. Um, please don't hesitate to add it. Um, that's the only question in the chat right now. If someone wants to raise their hand and um, ask a question directly, maybe we can move to that stage. In the meantime, I'm curious, this is maybe more of a comment. Um, I am uh, thinking about the different languages and how that's um, separating folks, but I, we also just recently went through uh, redistricting here in Michigan. And in that process, they found a lot of different communities of interest. And I wonder um, if that's a way to, it seems like one of the ways folks might become vulnerable to misinformation is um, by separation from other communities. Um, and I, I wonder if there's any way to sort of also reach people through other sort of um, communities of interest uh, and, and tie people and maybe actively tie people together more too. But this, I don't know, I don't expect you to have an answer to that. No, I actually have an answer for that. And I am very oh. excited. <laughs> Again, this is also because I am not a native English speaker. So this issue is very important for me. I will tell you about a project that we did a few weeks ago in Texas. Uh, we wanted to try uh, to do a pilot to figure out um, what uh, because um, specific communities aren't being addressed because some of them uh, don't really read Eng uh, read English language or he, you know they 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 mainly consume information that are within their own language right but they are still a part of our community so how do we reach out to them especially in certain important issues such as maybe vaccinations or election, right? So we did a thing with the Texas Tribune and we just reached out to them. We selected them because they are nonprofit and that their voter guide does not mention any campaign, any partisanship, it's just the system. They elaborate on where you go to vote, where you live, and then you know, uh, put out the details on them and who's on the ballot. So we work with them and we translated that 
a voter guide into two language, three language, Spanish, but they took care of that on their own. But we work with the Vietnamese and the Tagalog. Uh, my job of the bargain is that I will contact all of the local uh, news media in Texas that I have in my Rolodex to have them cross publicized this voter guide, no strings attached, because we assume that they these local newsrooms are very small and they're stretched for resources. Sometimes it's just three people trying to do everything. So what we do, we come with the voter guide within their own, they can copy paste or they can just read it, right? There's no more covering investigating needed to be done. So I started out with a uh, only seven uh, news media organization. Uh, actually eight, three are Filipino and the rest are Vietnamese. And as I started to reach out to, and they agreed to cross publicize, but in the end, we got 19. Um, most of them, interestingly, are actually radio. Um, and what we learn is that they are stretched for resources. They are tired. They don't know where to even begin, right? And if you, if we just help them get the information that they need, and they don't have to be suspicious about you know, partisanship or whatever, here's a voter guide. Here's a detail of vaccination, no strings attached. I even say, you can mention Pan America if you want. You, 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 can't, you can pick it and choose which paragraph that you think is most important to your community. But let me know once you cross publicized, uh, if you can record when you were, you know, it, that would be great. Uh, but if not, that's fine too. We did end it up. They were excited. They sent like snippets of the audios and the videos. And 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 even one, some of them are straight to print. So uh, the day before they were frantically calling me. It's like, which, which I'm not, English is my second language and English is their second language. So we were trying to figure out layout. And I say, I, it's, you decide layout. We don't really care if we, you know, you can put it on the right, on the left, whichever details. And that ended up with a lot of good feedback. So that gives us the boost that like, okay, what, do they, what they need is just resources. And we want to start from there, but we want to find more organizations that can play the role like the Texas Tribune. If you issue a voter guide that are nonpartisan, uh, that is detailed, and you want to distribute it, but you don't have a Vietnamese translation, let's, you know, let's work out a collaboration. If you don't have a Tagalog translation, you know, we can figure out what we can, you know, work on if you're planning a pre-bunking campaign for next election, you know? So that's that's kind of what, what, what we want to do and how we think we would be able to address, uh, you know, certain communities, uh, vulnerability in disinformation. Thank you. I'm so excited to hear that answer. <laughs> um, I'll open the floor up to others. Uh, if there's any questions or anyone else who has a comment to add. If you would, if you would rather and raise your hand uh, by going down to the reactions, um, we can just enable your mic. If you would rather ask it verbally. But thank you, Citra. That was uh, very useful. A lot of good information, and I'm pleased to hear about the projects that Pan America has underway. Um, the website is penamerica.org. No, pen.org. Okay, I, I, right. I know it. I just <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure people had it to uh... right. And even before, because I know we have a new website and resources coming up, but if you want to know, I have a list of tools ready in a Google Doc. If you guys want to know and want to use them, you know, please start reaching out to me and, and I would be more than happy to share them. And these are all free, right? These tools, they're not pens, they're not, but there are all already available tools. Okay, so we can start from there. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Citra, and to Hannah. Um, I, uh, you can, if you want to make suggestions about future programs, 
you can email me directly. We are still looking for for suggestions and and speakers, and we know we can go to Pen America. We have done so several times. Um, and we do finally have our own channel on the library's YouTube channel. Or, well, I'm not sure of the terminology, <laughs> but something specifically for uh, the uh, League of Women Voters programs. It will be a week or two before it's there, just because of the way our marketing department works. But I put the, our YouTube channel in uh, in the chat. Anything else anyone would like to know? All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thanks to everyone for coming. Goodbye. <laughs>